I would like to introduce Dean Cave. Dean Cave has been with the college for 40 years and he has served as the Dean of the University of Minnesota College of Science and Engineering since 2018. He has also held various other roles, including a role as Associate Dean for Research and Planning for 15 years between 1990 and 2005. And he joined the university uh, through the electrical and computer engineering department in 1975. So lots of wonderful history and experience with the college and we greatly appreciate that. And Moss, from here, I will go ahead and mute myself and let you take the floor. <laughs> Thank you, Megan. And uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you. Thank you so much for joining us uh, on this beautiful Minneapolis day, uh, no matter where you are. It is actually a beautiful day in Minneapolis. And, um, and I'm speaking to you uh, virtually from in front of uh, um, Tate Hall. Uh, for those of you particularly who fondly remember your, your classes and other engagements in Tate, if you haven't been on campus recently, um, plan on it. The next time you're around this place, uh, it is a gorgeous renovation and redone of, of the building and um, take advantage of seeing uh, the, the, the beautiful inside and uh, the spaces for all the students to hang out and have places to study and, and socialize as well as, um, and of course, uh, updated lecture rooms and everything else. Of course, we are talking about things going in that direction where all the students can be on campus and we all can be on campus together. And we're very hopeful that that will happen um, by next fall. Uh, there, there is obviously a great deal of desire on all of our parts to get back together and we will work towards that direction. At least this is the hope. And as the vaccination proceeds better, we, um, we hope to uh, be doing that for next fall and this summer. Um, just a few words. Uh, we, we are truly um, uh, delighted to have the opportunity to, to hold these lunch and learn uh, sessions. Uh, where we highlight during each one of these, one of the uh, departments, one of the units of the College of Science and Engineering, and just give you a glimpse of some of the exciting research that goes on in, in, our, um, in our departments. And of course, today we, we are highlighting the School of Physics and Astronomy. So tremendously pleased to uh, have that opportunity with our colleagues from Physics and Astronomy. Uh, the the um, year has been going well, all things considered. Our, our students have continued to take their classes, uh, roughly about three quarters of their classes or a bit more remotely, but uh, laboratories and uh, some of the small cla smaller classes where social distancing can be maintained uh, have continued. And... Um, and, and research, of course, has continued in uh, without, essentially, other than the initial interruption when, when we all pivoted to uh, remote and on-campus processes. And those have been going really well. And we'll, I'm excited to join you in hearing some of that research um, today, uh, about some of that research today. The other thing that I want to take have this opportunity to thank many, many of you, thank all of you for supporting your college and supporting the university. We're uh, nearing the end of the um, driven campaign for the university. And I'm very pleased to uh, let you know that we have well surpassed the initial goal of the campaign for the College of Science and Engineering thank you for, for your generosity and thank you for your support of our students, our faculty, our programs, and the infrastructure which, which we desperately need. You, I, I'm showing you a Tate Hall, which was the beneficiary of a, this amazing upgrade. And we are working very hard with the state of Minnesota to be able to come up with another significant uh, capital project for um, uh, instructional 
activities. Uh, these are instruction laboratories for the Department of Chemistry. And uh, we're well on our way on our design. We have had design funding for that project and we're well on our way with that design being completed. And so just hopeful that the next chance we get to, to get the bonding request funded by the um, state of Minnesota that we can break ground and uh, give our students, um, future students certainly across the university and in our college, a 21st century experience in, in their chemistry laboratories. Uh, Megan mentioned uh, my long years at the University of Minnesota. It's actually 46 years almost, uh, more than uh, 40 certainly. And um, so this is my last year as, as Dean. And you may know already that uh, the university, the provost will be starting a search very shortly for, for a new Dean of the College of Science and Engineering. And again, I hope that you stay engaged in that process as well, because the future certainly is bright for the college and um, particularly with, with your support. I will not take any more of your time uh, other than to say, I'm really sorry we couldn't serve you lunch. Um, you know, normally we will be meeting in Walter Library and we would have some sandwiches and other refreshments for those of you who could be on campus with us. Um, the flip side of it is that uh, with this remote connection, uh, we can really have a chance to speak to many, many more of you, uh, no matter where you are, frankly, in, in the world. So that is certainly an opportunity that we will continue to take advantage of uh, even once we are back on, on campus. So thank you very much. And let me now move um, to introducing my distinguished colleague, um, Paul Kroll. Uh, Professor Kroll received his PhD in low temperature physics uh, from Cornell University in 1994 and was a postdoctoral associate at CNRS in Grenoble in France and at the University of California in Santa Barbara before jo joining the faculty of uh, the School of Physics and Astronomy in 1997. Is currently a professor of physics and the head of the uh, School of Physics and Astronomy. Professor Kroll's research focuses on spin dynamics in ferromagnets, on sub nanosecond time scale and spin transport in hybrid ferromagnet semiconductor and ferromagnet normal metal systems. He is a fellow of the American Physical Society. So I hand off um, the, the session to. Uh, Professor Kroll to uh, say a few words about the school and, and then introduce to our distinguished colleagues who will be speaking with you about their research. Thank you, Paul, take it off. Uh, thank you, Moss. And um, I'd also like to extend my thanks to the audience uh, for your support of the college, as well as uh, joining us today uh, to hear from uh, two of the newest members of our faculty. Um, I'll say a couple words about uh, the status of the, the School of Physics and Astronomy. It's been a year of, of challenge and change. Um, one, one change uh, is a, a new website that I encourage you to uh, check out if you haven't already um, to catch up on the activities in the school at the moment. Um, featured there is uh, on the homepage is a picture of the Parker Solar Probe which is um, one of the projects of our, our space physics group. And uh, there are other things going on in the school this year. I've listed a few in the middle of this slide are the, the CubeSat effort, which is a um, effort being led by uh, Professor Lindsay Glesner involving many, many undergraduate students. And there's also a big uh, construction project for the so-called MUTUI experiment, uh, which is uh, actually involves about 40 undergraduate students at the moment. We have a new NSF training grant in um, uh, multi-messenger astrophysics. Uh, I think you'll be hearing uh, one of the talks later this spring, um, one of the public lectures, uh, Pat Kelly will probably say a bit about uh, that field, which is really burgeoning in the past few years. Um, new activities involving Zooniverse, which my uh, associate head, uh, Lucy Fortson directs. Um, and you can get things and other snippets of, of research on, on the website as well. 
Um, before introducing the speakers today, I'll um, introduce uh, remotely and, and particularly virtually, he's not actually here with us today, but Jen Liu, newest member of our faculty, just joined us in January. He's a high energy theorist, um, and uh, we're looking forward to his joining a group with, with uh, Tony Ruggetta, Keith Olive, and others. And um, as always, uh, people join, and, and we've had some retirements. I'll, I'll note in particular that Alan Goldman, who has been with us for uh, 55, actually going on 56 years, and he's continuing as a professor emeritus, but um, he officially retired this past year. Um, he was a previous head of the school from uh, 1996 to 2009. And Ron Poling, my immediate predecessor as head, is um, also going to emeritus status, although, of course, continuing his activities. All right. Um, so I do encourage you to uh, 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 check out our website. There are a few public lectures that are going on this spring. Um, uh, as Ma said, it's been a year of, of challenge. So uh, in fact, this afternoon, we're doing our open house for new graduate students also by uh, Zoom. OK, so without further ado, I will um, uh, introduce uh, today's uh, speakers. And although uh, Jen, who I just mentioned, is the newest member of our faculty, uh, the newest members minus two are uh, Andrew Fermansky and, and Nadja Strobel. They are both in uh, the field of high energy physics. So, so this is exploring what's going on at uh, the highest energies and smallest length scales, at least much smaller than the ones that I deal with as a condensed matter physicist. And um, you'll be hearing uh, presentations from today about two of the uh, main efforts in our high energy physics group. So uh, Professor Andrew Fermansky will be telling you about um, the frontiers of neutrino physics. Uh, uh, Andrew got his uh, bachelor's degree from the University of Cambridge, uh, followed by a master's, and then he received his uh, PhD from the University of Warwick in, in 2015. Um, he was then a postdoc at Manchester and spending time also at Fermilab in the US on um, uh, uh, the uh, Microboon experiment. And um, that is a neutrino experiment uh, uh, and therefore makes him eminently well prepared to discuss uh, the next generation of neutrino experiments which, which you're gonna be hearing about today. Uh, Nadja Strobe is from Belgium and uh, she got uh, all three of her degrees from the University of Ghent, and after which uh, she was a postdoc at the Fermi uh, at Fermi Lab before joining us in um, in 2019, and she'll be telling us about um, efforts at CERN in Switzerland, the Large Hadron Collider, in which she, along with her colleagues uh, Jeremy Manns and Roger Rusak, are members of the Compact Muon Solenoid Experiment one of the largest efforts in high energy physics in the world. Um, as you'll see from their talks, their efforts sort of complement each other. They're both looking at frontiers of particle physics, but in sort of different realms of, of phase space um, where there's a lot going on and these address things like uh, dark energy and um, a sort of uh, well, topics that are of interest to other members, all of us as physicists and certainly other members of the school. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to you. Um, Andy will be telling us first about um, the uh, frontiers in neutrino physics. Thank you very much for the, uh, the very nice introduction, Paul. Um, so as, as Paul mentioned, I'm gonna be talking about uh, neutrino physics, uh, an experiment called the Deep Underground Neutrino Experiment. As was mentioned, both talks today cover particle physics or high energy physics, where we study the smallest, most fundamental building blocks of the universe, uh, studying the particles that exist, how they interact with one another, how they merge and combine to form different particles, eventually atoms, uh, molecules, etc. And in doing so, we try to explain why the universe looks and behaves the way it does. So the experiment I'm going to be telling you about is DUNE, which stands for the Deep Underground Neutrino Experiment. 
Now, most of you will understand the words deep underground and experiment, but neutrino for some of you may be a new word. So a neutrino is a fundamental particle. Uh, it is, as, we, as, as far as we know, uh, not made of anything else. It is as fundamental as you can get. It has zero electric charge and zero magnetic field and almost zero mass. It's actually too small to have been able to determine what its mass is, but we know it has to not be zero. And those facts about the neutrino make it incredibly hard to detect, which is why it's often referred to as the ghost particle. Neutrinos are actually incredibly ubiquitous uh, across the universe. They're produced in a number of different places. Uh, supernovae from exploding stars produce huge numbers of neutrinos, uh, but they're also produced continuously in the sun, in all stars, in nuclear power plants, and even uh, something like 10 per minute produced from potassium decays inside any given banana. But we can also produce concentrated beams of neutrinos using proton accelerators. Uh, the picture on the left here shows the um, main injector accelerator at Fermilab, which is used to produce a beam of neutrinos. And on the right, you can see uh, one of our magnetic focusing horns that we use to focus the particles that eventually turn into a neutrino beam. <clears throat> So neutrinos are incredibly hard to detect. They're incredibly common. Uh, something like 65 million each second travel through any person's thumbnail coming from the sun. Billions each second fly through your body. But most of them just fly straight through uh, without even noticing that you're there. However, occasionally, uh, when you have that many neutrinos flying through something, occasionally one of them will collide with an atomic nucleus. When they do, they produce charged particles uh, that fly out of the atomic nucleus and can fly far enough through your detector that you can measure them. So that looks something like this. Uh, this is actually from the microboon experiment, which I, uh, I worked on for many years and, and continue to, um, which is effectively a prototype for the Dune experiment. Um, so you can see in the middle of this, uh, of this display here, a number of particles that leave traces in the detector and they all emanate from the same point and there is nothing coming in from the left hand side. Now we know because we fire a, a beam of neutrinos in a certain direction here that the neutrino beam is coming in from the left and so what you're seeing here is effectively an invisible neutrino flying through the detector interacting with the nucleus and producing all of these particles. Now by, by uh, measuring the lengths and angles and types of all the particles produced, we can infer what the neutrino's energy was and what type of neutrino it was. Now, the reason we particularly want to do that is because neutrinos have been found to do something very strange. Uh, there are three types of neutrino, the electron neutrino, muon neutrino, and the tau neutrino. Uh, we re refer to these as flavors of neutrino. And it turns out that the, the neutrinos actually change back and forth between the different flavors as they travel. So this is a phenomenon known as neutrino oscillations. And you can see here on the left, uh, some data from actually a, an experiment in Japan. Uh, the top left plot in particular, you can see uh, the number of neutrinos detected as a function of distance traveled is going up and down as you increase that distance. Now you can see here the length scale that's over is sort of a uh, hundred kilometers, which is a pretty long distance. Uh, I'm actually gonna be talking about even longer distances for, for Dune. Now, this is particularly relevant for uh, understanding the fundamental behavior of the universe, because it's possible that neutrinos and antineutrinos oscillate differently. If we look around the universe, we see that the universe is made almost entirely of matter. There's almost no antimatter around. And we don't have a mechanism uh, in our theories that can explain the production of matter without the simultaneous production of antimatter. However, it is possible that if neutrinos and antineutrinos oscillate differently, that is one piece of the puzzle to explain why you, the universe uh, has this matter-antimatter asymmetry. Additionally, neutrino oscillations are only possible if neutrinos have a non-zero mass. So neutrinos for a long time we assumed had zero mass because when we tried to measure their mass we effectively found that they didn't have a mass. Um, 
But the fact that they oscillate means that they actually have to have mass. The problem with that is that our standard mechanism for explaining how particles have mass is through coupling to the Higgs boson or the, through the Higgs mechanism, which is something that was discovered uh, at the Large Hadron Collider, as you'll hear shortly. But that mechanism doesn't work for neutrinos for a variety of reasons. So we know through oscillations they have to have mass, but we can't explain why. So this uh, prompts further study. So what do you actually need in order to make uh, measurements of neutrino oscillations? Well, the first thing you need, because they don't interact very frequently, is as many neutrinos as you can muster. You need as big a detector as you can get, because uh, a larger detector will interact, will have more neutrinos interact with it and allow you to measure more of them. Uh, more measurements allows more precision. You want that detector to be as sensitive as possible. And so one challenge in neutrino physics is uh, balancing being able to build a very large detector with a detector that's very sensitive. It's very easy to build a very small, highly sensitive detector. But building one that can be scaled up to very large sizes is challenging. We also require as little external noise as possible because the neutrino signal is quite rare. You don't want to uh, be smothered by other backgrounds. And that motivates generally uh, putting your detectors underground as deep as you can so that you have earth above the, the detector. Any particles coming down from the atmosphere, uh, in from space and from the sun, etc., they'll be absorbed by the earth above the detector, allowing you to see the rare neutrino oscillations very easily. And now the other thing you need is enough distance between your neutrino source and your detector to actually observe these oscillation effects. So the data I showed earlier was order 100 uh, kilometers for the neutrino energies that we use now. It's uh, significantly further than that. I thought it'd be nice to run through a brief history of uh, Minnesota's involvement in neutrino experiments, uh, which started with uh, the Sudan experiment. Now, this actually wasn't a neutrino experiment. It was searching for proton decay, uh, seeing if protons were unstable. This was run in the early 80s up in the Sudan lab in northern Minnesota, which the location you can see on the map on the left is about a six hour drive in good weather and no traffic uh, from the Twin Cities. Now, this didn't see proton decay, but it was then upgraded a few years later to the Sudan 2 experiment. And at this point, the detector reached the mass of a thousand tons already. This still looked for proton decay and still saw no protons decaying but it did see this neutrino oscillation signature. This was then <coughs> uh, compared to other experiments around the world that had seen similar uh, oscillation signatures and it motivated yet more upgrades. So these neutrino oscillations were seen in neutrinos that are produced in the upper atmosphere. It was then upgraded effectively to produce the MINOS experiment. So MINOS was now a 6,000 ton detector um, it started running in 2003, and for the first time, we used an artificial source of neutrinos uh, to get this highly focused neutrino beam that was actually produced at uh, a particle accelerator in Fermilab, which is just outside Chicago, and sent uh, around 600 miles to the MINOS detector. Now, all of this was happening underground, about half a mile underground in the Sudan mine. Once MINOS had uh, effectively run its course, it was time for another upgrade. So now we stepped from a 6,000 ton detector to a 14,000 ton detector. The other difference here is that the, uh, the NOVA detector that we then built was in a slightly different place. It sampled the beam slightly differently, but it was still the same neutrino beam. And it's also a more sensitive experiment, a more sensitive detector than MINOS. So we increased the scale, the mass by about a factor of two, but we also increased the sensitivity. NOVA is actually built on the surface, uh, unlike the other ones. And there's, there's some uh, interesting reasons why it was able to be run on the surface uh, and still reject backgrounds. The most recent data from NOVA looks something like this. So you can see there's about 200 events, uh, neutrino interactions observed in this detector. Um, and when we run in the anti-neutrino beam mode, uh, there's about 100 events observed. Now, those of you who are familiar with statistics uh, should realize that 
uh, the statistical uncertainty on 100 events is around 10%. So to improve on this, we need yet another upgrade. That brings us to the Deep Underground Neutrino Experiment, or DUNE for short. It will run from uh, Fermilab again using the same proton accelerator, although we're going to build a new neutrino beam that points in a different direction. And that will now point over to South Dakota. We're passing the mantle over to them, where the Sanford Underground Research Facility is available to build a large underground uh, particle detector. The Sanford Underground Lab is one mile underground. And uh, down in the bottom of that lab at the 4850 level, we're going to be building four giant cryostats, which will each house 10,000 tons of liquefied argon at 90 Kelvin. So there'll be two very large caverns built out. Each one will house two of these modules. They're connected by a series of tunnels, and there'll be a third uh, smaller region uh, carved out of the rock for um, various support systems, cryogenics, uh, data acquisition, computing, etc. Now, a single cryostat that houses 10,000 tons of liquid argon is kind of hard to imagine in your head. Now, frequently what we do is we put a small uh, image of a person to scale, you know, a six foot person uh, is drawn on this diagram to give you a sense of scale. But if I did that, you wouldn't actually be able to see them. So something you may be able to understand the scale of is an aeroplane. This is a Boeing 787 Dreamliner, and it would fit if you removed its wings inside one of these cryostats. So that's the kind of scale we're talking about. You could park uh, effectively a jumbo jet inside one of these. You would not be able to get it down the mine shaft, but if you could figure that bit out, you'd be able to get it in there. So inside each of these cryostats is 10,000 tons of liquid argon. That gives us the huge mass, or three times the mass of the NOVA experiment. Being buried a mile underground gives us uh, lower noise, external noise as well. But the argon itself doesn't uh, allow you to measure the particles. To do that, we need to add some sensitive electronic elements. Uh, so this is how we do that. We have 300 of these planes of wires. Each of the planes of wires is 2 meters by 6 meters and has 10,000 wires wrapped around it. The wires are each three millimeters apart and they're only a few microns thick. So these are the incredibly sensitive uh, detection elements that when merged with the large mass of the liquid argon gives us both of those requirements that we need. The, this is shown on its side uh, as a prototype being, uh, having the wires wrapped, wrapped around it. In the real detector, this will be flipped up on its end. So it's uh, high, it's long, uh, long side is vertical, and there'll be another one stacked on top of it to make a 12 meter tall element. And then uh, you have a number of those repeating throughout the detector. The Dune collaboration is uh, over a thousand members large at the moment. We have members from six continents around the world. This is a photo of us uh, at one of our recent meetings uh, about a year and a half ago now at Fermilab. Of course, for the last year or so, this is more what our meetings have looked like. Uh, many of us getting together on Zoom to talk about how to uh, design and construct this experiment. We have run two prototype detectors already. We ran these at CERN. Each of them was uh, effectively a scaled down version of the Dune detector. Uh, so each one was only, only 1,000 tons, which if you recall, was the size of the Sudan 2 experiment. So the Sudan 2 experiment which was 30 years ago, is now the same size as a prototype. There was significant input from teams from the University of Minnesota uh, to both design and run these prototypes. And now we also have involvement in the analysis of the data from them, uh, understanding what needs to be improved and changed in order to build the final experiment. And in fact, uh, a second prototype run is planned now for uh, 2022. The other big thing that uh, the University of Minnesota has been involved in is leveraging our existing facilities. Uh, so we have this big space that we uh, built the NOVA detector in, and we've been able to use that to test the procedures for the installation of these uh, large detection uh, wire pieces, um, particularly because stacking two of them on top of each other is not possible inside the prototype, which is only six meters tall you need some space where you have uh, 12 meters of height plus headroom 
Uh, and we've been able to use the Nova facilities to do that. So anything that's too big to be tested in the prototype is being tested in Minnesota while uh, digging is going on in South Dakota. On digging, uh, this is proof that digging has started. We have started excavating these large caverns underground in South Dakota. Uh, this was the groundbreaking ceremony where uh, a bunch of important people who generally wear suits and sign documents uh, get to put a hard hat on and pretend to dig. The real digging looks something like this. Um, this is actually a photo from, uh, from last year in South Dakota uh, where they were digging, preparing for conventional facilities installation, ready to uh, dig out those large caverns. So the digging construction is ongoing. Um, we're hoping to start collecting data in 2026. This is the kind of time scale we're talking about when you're building a 40,000 ton detector a mile underground. Um, so in 2026, we're expecting to have the beam running and at least one of those fire detector modules installed and working. The University of Minnesota teams are involved in almost all aspects of the experiment from its design, uh, construction, and then eventually running the experiment and analyzing the data to really learn about these neutrino oscillations and, and what they mean. So we're hoping that this is uh, going to allow us to strike gold once again in a South Dakota gold mine. Um, but neutrinos aren't the only thing about the universe that doesn't really uh, add up right now. So I'm going to hand over to Professor Strobo, who's going to tell you all about uh, what we're doing over at CERN with the Large Hadron Collider to learn more. Thanks a lot, Andy, for that. Um, so I will take over now. So the title of my talk is Searching for New Physics at the Large Hadron Collider. And so I'll be telling you a little bit about, you know, what is this new physics I'm talking about and how does this Large Hadron Collider uh, work and how do we use the data that it provides us. So the standard model of particle physics is the model that currently encapsulate everything we know about how the universe really works at a fundamental level. And so here are all the particles that we know about right now. So there's what we call quarks and there's what we call leptons. And you can see here at the bottom, here are these neutrinos that Andy just uh, told us about. And pretty much all of the everyday matter, you know, your atoms that you're made of, uh, is made out of these up and down quarks and electrons. And that's pretty much everything that we are made of. And you can see that there are two more copies of all these particles. Uh, we don't really know why they are there. We just know that they are. We've measured them. We know a lot about them now. Uh, we don't know if there are any more of these copies, so that's a question. Um, the particles on the right here are what we call the force particles. So these are things like the photon, which um, is the, the force carrier of the electromagnetic interaction. We also have these W and Z bosons here, which are responsible for the electro for the weak interaction. So that's what's involved with radioactive decay, for example. And then there's these gluons here. Um, and these ones um, hold the nucleus together. So that's the strong interaction. And then in the middle here is where we have the Higgs boson uh, that uh, Andy already alluded to. And that Higgs boson is a manifestation of the Higgs field, which is responsible for giving mass to the quarks, to these electrons, muons and taus, and also to these uh, Ws and Zs. Um, but as he said, it doesn't work for neutrinos. Um, and we've now observed this particle that was one of the big successes of the Large Hadron Collider experiments uh, in 2012. So now our picture of the standard model is kind of complete. We have measured pretty much everything that we think we need in this model, but there are some, some things that are still missing. And that's why we need you know, what we call new physics. We need something extra. Uh, and some of the things that we currently don't know about is, um, you know, what is the nature of dark matter? Uh, we know from astrophysical observations and cosmological observations that we're pretty sure dark matter exists. We're also pretty sure that it has to be some kind of particle. All the other hypotheses don't seem to really fit once you put all of the pieces together. And it turns out that there is um, something you know, about 5% more of this dark matter, uh, five times more dark matter than there is ordinary matter in our universe. Um, and so you, you may wonder, okay, what is this dark matter? And that's one of the questions that the LHC is hoping to, to answer along with a set of other experiments. Um, 
Another thing is that, you know, everybody knows gravity exists and we have Einstein's theory of gravity and that's all great and it works super well, but we don't really know how does that fit in with our particle physics view of things. Um, so that's something that our current theory does not explain. Um, it's mentioned by Andy, where did the antimatter go? We don't see that much in the universe. We don't know why. Um, there's also some more technical questions relating to the Higgs boson and why its mass is the value that it is, which is reasonably low. And so for all these questions, we wanna build some experiments to test those and to explore. And a very good way to do that is by building a collider because these colliders, you have a lot of good control, you are in control of things and you can use it for a very wide range of different um, topics. And so, you know, the basic principle of collider physics uh, goes a bit like this. So you have two beams of particles. You stick them inside a bunch of magnets and accelerator cavities. And for in our case, this would be protons. The higher the energy you put into these beams, the higher uh, the masses that you can produce of any new particle that you may be able to produce. And so you have one beam coming from one side, another beam coming from the other side, and you make them collide. And at that point where you make them collide, you build a detector particle detector. And you use that detector to observe everything that happens in that collision. Any new par any particles that are produced, usually there are a lot, uh, you use that to observe what happens. Then you try to reconstruct what actually happened at the very moment of the collision. You try to figure out, okay, what particles were really produced that maybe didn't live very long, and so you couldn't see them directly, but we can reconstruct what happened. And once you do that, then you can ask the question, you know, did anything unknown occur? Did it all match up with what we expect? Or is there something new going on there? Um, and that's kind of the basic principle um, of any collider uh, for particle physics. And we have um, faculty and students here at the U who are working mainly on these aspects two and three. Uh, the collider is sort of given to us by CERN and then we are responsible for building, operating, upgrading any of the detectors and also doing all the data analysis. So this is a picture here of the Large Hadron Collider. You can see here the tunnel with the big magnets. Um, this is a very large collider. Um, it is the largest one currently in existence. It's about 16 and a half miles in circumference. It is located on the Swiss-French border. And you can see here, there's a picture of the Jura Mountains and Lake Geneva or Lac Le Mans as it's actually called. The CERN main site is here. And then the actual collider, you can see the outline of it here which of course is actually about hundred meters underground so that you can't see it on the surface. Uh, it produces 40, 40 million collisions every second. So that is a lot of collisions. Um, and the collisions are currently using an energy of 13 TeV, uh, which that may not seem, you know, you might not have a good intuition of what that means, but it's the highest energy we've ever achieved in this kind of uh, particle collider. And for any individual proton, so two protons collide, any of the individual protons, it's the energy that you would have in a mosquito flying, but compressed down into about the size, you know, 100,000 times smaller than a mosquito. Um, and if you combine all of the particles, all the protons that are circling in this beam, it's about the energy that you have in a high-speed train. So it is a lot of energy. Um, and that's all done and kept in place by these um, over 1200 uh, superconducting magnets uh, that run, that produce an eight Tesla magnetic field uh, and they run at liquid helium temperatures. So it's a pretty impressive uh, device. And so this is our accelerator and then the detector that I'm a part of, the experiment I'm part of is called the compact muon solenoid experiment. And you can see a picture here in the top um, where this is not during running time, this is where we're doing some, some work to it. So it's been pulled apart uh, a little bit because it's our detector is effectively one huge cylinder. And so you have two plugs on the ends that can come out and that's sort of this plug here that you can see. There is a person here for scale, so you can get a sense. It is about 15 meters tall and 15 meters wide and about 21 meters long in sort of the dimension you can't see. Um, for that size, it is um, quite heavy. It is 14,000 tons, and most of that is our huge magnet. So that's why the solenoid is in our um, name, because we have this huge solenoid magnet that delivers a four Tesla field. Uh, it's inner diameter of the solenoid is six meters. And so that's, that was the biggest, we wanted the biggest magnet we could. 
And we were limited by the size of the roads in the small towns in France. So we built the biggest one we could actually transport. Um, and our experiment is it's very big. Uh, like the Dune experiment, these uh, collaborations are enormous. It's also global. We have about 51 countries participating in our experiments. We have about 3,000 physicists and about 1,000 engineers that, uh, that work on our, on our experiments uh, on a daily basis. And I thought I'd show the little layered structure in cake form, which was um, a couple of Minnesota grad students made this cake a few years ago. So I thought I'd highlight it because it's quite fun. Uh, the other sort of nickname for CMS is also the Cake Making Society. So lots of us like baking. Um, so now you might wonder, okay, you have this huge detector. How does it actually work? How, did, how can we distinguish between all the different particles that are produced in any given collision? You, know, you collide two protons and a whole bunch of stuff flies out all kinds of different particles. And we want to figure out, you know, which, how many are there, what kind are there, what is their energy or their momentum. And to do that, we have this layered structure in our detector. So you can see this is a transverse slice. So if you see here, you know, if you just take one slice here, this is kind of a schematic view of that. And these are different types of particles. So some of them have electric charge, like the electron or its heavier cousin, the muon or charged hadrons, which are things like pions, or it could also be a proton, for example. And then there are neutral particles, which have these dashed lines. That could be a photon, or it could be things like a neutron, for example. On the very center part of our detector, we have what we call a tracking detector. And this one is made completely out of silicon, plus some support structure. And the idea is that as a charged particle traverses these various layers in this detector, a little bit of electric charge is produced, so a little current signal, and we can see that as it goes through each layer. Um, so by observing where all the hits are, you can kind of piece together the track of the particle and you can infer that a particle passed through. And because all of this is also in a magnetic field, um, the curvature of those tracks will tell you uh, something about the momentum of that particle. So that's how we can figure out all of the charged tracks. Of course, any charged particle will leave a track here, any neutral particle will not. So that doesn't, by itself, it's not enough to figure out what happens. And that's why we have these other layers. So the next one is called the electromagnetic calorimeter. And you can see here, these are lead tungstate state crystals. Um, when energetic particles hit this, like an electron or a photon, a whole shower of new particles is produced and effectively is stopped in this material. And all of the energy is deposited in here. And these crystals are chosen because they have a nice property, which is that they scintillate. So they produce light as these particles deposit energy. We can then detect that light and figure out how much energy was deposited. And so in this electromagnetic part, we see signals from electrons and photons. There is then a bigger calorimeter, which is called the hadron calorimeter behind it, which captures all the hadrons, either charged or neutral. And then you may wonder, well, there's this one track that goes all the way out, that is the muon. That one, we cannot stop. It just flies straight through our detector, but we can track it because it is charged. And so if we see signals in these muon chambers at the very outer edge of our detector, we can be pretty sure that that's the muon. And so because we have all these different um, signatures here, when we piece all the information together, we get a pretty good idea of what's going on. It's also important to note that these neutrinos we talked about earlier, they just pass through our detector pretty much completely undetected all the time. And so we do not have a direct measurement of them. Uh, we can infer that they were there um, by observing all of the energy that was and momentum that was produced in the collision. And if we see that it doesn't quite balance out, then we can infer that you know, these neutrinos must have been there. Um, so we do lots of physics with this great detector. Uh, we've published over a thousand articles already. So there's way too many for me to really go into any detail. So I wanted to just highlight, uh, again, the discovery of the Higgs boson, uh, which has shown here uh, some of the recent measurements of this Higgs boson, because of course, once we discover it, we want to investigate it and understand as much as we can. And so this red bump here is the events that we are pretty sure are Higgs bosons. Um, there's a little bit of background in this area, but most of it is the Higgs boson. We've also done other measurements of um, really precise measurements of things we, we know and we want to understand better. And then there's a wide range of searches for new physics. And these really target 
any possible model that any theorist pretty much has ever imagined. Uh, we look for signatures of dark matter particles, of supersymmetric particles, extra dimensions, extra generations of particles. Um, and so, so far, you know, as you probably realize, since there hasn't been a big press release, is we have not found any evidence of new physics so far, but we've managed to exclude a lot of these theoretical models and ideas. Um, and so that helps guide us towards, you know, what might actually be out there and how everything will fit together. Um, <clears throat> and even though we've done so many searches, there's still quite a number of gaps in our coverage. Um, and so more and more these days, we're starting to leverage machine learning techniques to really dig deep and uncover everything there is to uncover with this data. And so you might wonder, okay, what does the future hold? We've already been running for about 10 years now, and we've accumulated a lot of data. You can see here in this plot, sort of how much data we got for you know, each year that the LHC has been operational. So this one here was 2018 where we got the most. Uh, and this is about 15 times more data than the previous collider, the Tevatron and in Chicago uh, produced. But over the lifetime of the LHC, this is only about 5% of the total data that we are going to get. So there's still a lot more to come and that will allow us to explore a lot more rare phenomena. And so I don't want you to look too close at this plot because it's too small, but these are all sorts of different measurements that we've done with various production cross sections. So how often they occur. And if we get more data, we can go further down this plot and really and start adding more lines there. Now we can't see them because we don't have enough data, but once we have you know, 20 times more data than we have right now, we'll be able to go, go lower than that. Uh, and the, to be able to achieve that, you know, if we just use the current version of our, our collider and our detectors, that would take forever. Uh, we don't want to wait that long. Uh, and so to deliver all this data, there will be a big upgrade of the Large Hadron Collider in 2025, 2027 is when this upgrade will be installed. The main thing is that they will be installing stronger magnets um, so that they can squeeze the proton bunches together more. Because when you collide these protons, you're not just colliding one proton and one proton. That would you know, be very inefficient. You make bunches of protons. There's about 100 billion protons per bunch. And then you have a whole sequence of these bunches. There's close to 3,000 bunches in a beam. And so you let them circle. And every time that the bunches cross, you can have collisions. Um, and here is a plot that shows how many collisions you have on average when these bunches cross. And up till now, it's been in the range of, let's say, 30 to 40 collisions that happen every time these bunches cross. And so that means that anytime you're looking at what we call an event, there's really 30 to 40 different collisions all overlaid on top of each other. And so this is kind of what this looks like. So this is a case where there were 78 interactions happening. And so there's a whole lot of stuff going on in your detector. And so the challenge for our detectors is really to tease these different collisions apart and to focus on the ones that are really interesting. Because most of the time, there's only one of these collisions that's actually interesting. And so you want to figure out which one of these vertices, the point where the collision happened, is the interesting one, which of these tracks, the particles that left these tracks, belong to that particular collision, and kind of get rid of all the rest of them. And as we do this um, new upgrade of the Large Hadron Collider, you know, this picture you see here, imagine you know, twice as many things happening in here. And that's the environment that we'll have after this collision. So that's quite a challenge for our detector and our current detector will not be able to keep up with this. So our detector also has to be upgraded and which is a big focus of, of our whole collaboration right now. Um, because if we have more data coming in, more collisions, it means that there's gonna be more radiation. So our electronics need to be able to handle that. Um, so we need to make everything more radiation hard. Um, we have to make every individual channel size smaller so that it doesn't look like everything is lit up like a Christmas tree. And we have to increase the bandwidth so that we can get all of that data out in time, because uh, that's also a big challenge. And so our group here at Minnesota with, as was mentioned by Paul, we have three faculty and order of 10 students working on this. We work on the texture electronics for one of these big upgrades. Um, and so the upgrade that we're working on is if you have this plug part here of the cylinder, this whole thing will effectively be cut off and replaced by a new calorimeter. And that's what we are working on. And you can see some prototype uh, boards here. So you might wonder, okay, what can we do with this new detector? Um, so one thing, of course, is that it will bring us back to a more normal level of what is called pileup, right? These are all these different interactions happening at the same time, because our new detector ha will have precision timing capabilities. And so in this little plot, you can see these are all these different vertices as a function of position 
along here. And the y-axis here is the time at which they happen. And this is in nanoseconds, so you can get a scale. This is about one nanosecond long. And if you don't have very precise timing information, these two collisions, for example, they would appear to be the same because they happen at the same position. And if you can't disentangle the timing, they look like they are the same. With this better timing information, we can then separate them because they happen at a different time. And that will effectively reduce that pileup back to a level that's more manageable. Um, this new colorimeter that our group is working on is going to be quite uh, amazing. It will give us an unprecedented view of how a particle shower happens as it passes through this material. Uh, it'll have effectively five-dimensional information. It will give us, you know, the 3D for the position. It will give us precision in the time and also very precise measurement of the energy of these particles. And all of that combined will mean that one, we'll be able to keep doing what we're doing at the same uh, level of precision, even with extra radiation and all of that stuff. But we'll also be able to do new things that we couldn't do before because these are really new capabilities. And so that will expand everything that we can do. And we're quite excited about that. And so just to summarize, um, collider physics is a very active field. You know, we have about 4,000 people in our experiment. There's a partner experiment called ATLAS, which has about the same number of people. And we're all working really hard uh, on this, um, extracting as much as we can out of our data. And so far we have discovered the Higgs boson, which was one of our big goals. And now we keep on searching for any signs of new physics, because there's a lot of good reasons why it should be out there. And these collider experiments are really good places to look for them because they are so versatile. And so I would say our CMS experiment has a bright future, lots more data and a powerful detector upgrade. And our group is very excited uh, to be part of this. And this is a picture of a new publication we just put out as our group. So I thought I'd highlight it here. It has lots of particles flying out. So it's quite exciting. I think that is all that I had. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, thank you, Nadja and uh, Andy. Um, the, uh, I have questions. I think there's some in the chat as well as in the Q&A box. And I'll, um, uh, there's some great ones from the audience here. And I'll, um, I'm going to start by answering one <laughs> Or, or, or giving one to Andy, which I accidentally deleted when I was trying to figure this system out. Uh, but that is on the status of Nova. Is it uh, is it still ongoing or completed? Yeah, the the Nova experiment is still running. Uh, the neutrino beam is still running, and the detector is still running. Uh, even through COVID, we've been able to continue everything running. Um, while the new beam is being built uh, at Fermilab, we can actually continue to run the Nova beam. Um, until about a year before we turn the new one on, at which point we have to turn the accelerator off uh, and, and reconnect some, uh, some things. So Nova is expected to run until about 2025, and it will collect something like a factor of two more data than it currently has. And then uh, starting in 2026, we can start running the Dune experiment. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, and. Um, Nadja, there was one here in um, the chat, which is, uh, uh, will making a larger collider lead to new physics? And um, is this on the table? Is it, and is it likely to be done by China? What yeah, that's a very good question. Just making a bigger toy. Yeah, it, it's a very good question. There are definitely, we are studying actively what the sort of options would be for a next collider, sort of for, you know, in the longer future. Uh, and a lot of people are thinking, you know, make it bigger because then you can get to higher energy and that will open up new, new phase space. If, so, if the new physics happens to be, have more mass than what we can currently reach with the LHC, maybe let's say hundred TeV. So now we're at 13. So we're thinking sort of order of magnitude bigger. Uh, we also means that it would probably have to be like hundred kilometers in, circum in circumference. So it becomes really big, which means it's very expensive. So we want to make sure that it is well motivated. And we actually have a whole community exercise going on, which is evaluating different options um, and what they will bring to the table, what we'll be able to do with them that we currently cannot do. Um, so there's, there's talk both within the US and Europe and also within China uh, for these various options. And I think right now that's not quite been decided yet what is gonna happen in the future, but um, our field is actively looking into it. So you'll, you'll hear more about that once we figure it out. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think uh, I, a lot have come in here. We'll try to do our best to answer uh, a good fraction of them. 
Um, here's one for you, Andy. How do you create a neutrino beam if they have no charge and no magnetic moment? Uh, with, with some difficulty. It's from uh, a former 1302 student because they know that you steer things around with electric and magnetic fields. Yeah, so, so one of the challenges with a neutrino beam is that you can't focus the neutrinos themselves. So you start with a beam of protons, which you can accelerate and focus. Uh, you smash the protons into uh, an object that we call a target, um, and that produces a spray of other particles, which you can also focus, at least some of them. And then you just point those focused particles into what we call a decay tunnel, and you let them decay to produce neutrinos. And because all the initial particles are flying in the same direction, the neutrinos producing those decays will, on average, also point in that direction. When we say it's a beam of neutrinos, it's not a beam like uh, like the LHC produces a beam of protons that's like, I don't know, a few centimeters across. This beam of, beam of neutrinos, uh, when it's produced at Fermilab, is, is tens of meters wide. Uh, and by the time it gets over to South Dakota, uh, you'll be able to see the neutrinos from it uh, for actually several miles across in principle. So it, it's not easy uh, and it's not really a beam. It's more of a spray. All right, thank you. Um, uh, here's one for, for Nadia, sort of in the slightly more philosophical department. Mm -hmm. Is the question really where did the antimatter go? Or why do we have a surplus of normal matter? Or are they the same question? It's kind of the same question in a way, I would say. Um... Yeah, because you know, we what we think is happened is that at the very beginning of the Big Bang, they were produced in equal amounts, because that's kind of what our particles and our interaction that we know would do. But we know that there aren't, there isn't much antimatter remaining. So, but there is matter remaining. So you can either ask, you know, where did the antimatter go, or where did you know why is there more matter remaining? I think it's kind of the same question, um, and we currently don't know uh, why that is, and it's. It's a very big question that a lot of theories are trying to answer. So there's, you know, the neutrino aspect, and there's also aspects that can be addressed by collider physics um, and things we could see here. But it is a very big question. I would say it's sort of framing the same question in two different ways. Uh, we have several questions here that are, are related to funding, um, as in who pays for all this stuff. Uh, I'll just say for now, that's the Department of Energy. U.S. taxpayer, um, and for these international experiments, there's of course cooperative agreements that involve lots of politics as well. Um, but let's let's finish up with a couple more a um, uh, couple more ones on the science and engineering. Uh, uh, here's one for Andy on those huge liquid argon cryostats. How are they supplied, and um, will you? How do you going to are you going to liquefy the argon on site? Where's it going to come from? And how do you get it down into the mine, I guess? Yeah, that's one of the big questions we had to answer before, uh, before designing the experiment and before digging. Um, the technology for the cryostat is actually taken from uh, transporters for liquefied natural gas. Um, it uses the, the same technology as that industry, which can produce you know, ship, ocean-going ship-sized cryostats to transport liquefied gases. Um, there are two companies in the world that are able to produce these cryostats. One is in Japan, and the other one, I believe, is in France. Uh, and the French, the French company built the uh, prototype cryostats uh, through an arrangement with CERN, and we're expecting them to provide the cryostats for the final detector as well. Um, it's a, a fascinating uh, design, which uh, the shape is allowed to shrink and contract as the liquid argon goes in and, and cools the metal down uh, so it can shrink without distorting. In terms of getting the argon liquefied, uh, it turns out that uh, one thing you have to actually account for when you uh, design this experiment and, and try and price it is that uh, when we fill the dune detectors, we're going to be using something like 25% of the US's supply of liquid argon for two or three years while we fill it. And that's going to increase the price of argon. And so we have to account for that when we uh, calculate the price. Uh, the plan right now is to simply rely on existing 
uh, liquid argon production facilities buy argon from them and it will get driven in uh, cryogenic uh, cryogenic trucks like the type you see driving on highways occasionally um, just be driven up to the mine uh, and I believe it's going to be uh, sent down into the mine just through a, a pipe rather than being taken down in containers. All right. Um, why don't we? We'll, uh, I'll take two, two more here, and then if, if there are any questions which we haven't answered, I can um, certainly arrange uh, with Megan to sort of get them answered as part of the online presentation that will be uploaded. Um, one more for you, Nadja. Uh, you mentioned three particles that transfer forces, the electromagnetic strong and weak forces. And this is uh, from Richard Hendrickson who remembers, wasn't there another particle that is thought to be the analog for gravity? Um, and mm -hmm. is, is that, was that role assumed by the Higgs boson now or is there still a missing piece for gravity? Yeah, so there's still that missing piece for gravity. Um... You know, one idea is that gravity could be carried by something called the graviton, um, but we have never observed the graviton, um, although we, we think it, it exists, but we don't, we have never observed it. Uh, and that's one of these questions that we have right now is how do we fit gravity into this particle physics picture? And people are working on that, uh, things like quantum gravity, string theory, those are all attempts at trying to merge those, you know, our whole particle physics, um, which describes everything but gravity pretty much. And then you have gravity and how do you fit those two things together? Um, and this graviton particle kind of comes in mm -hmm. in that, but we haven't figured everything out how it quite all fits together. Um, so it's not something that the, uh, the Higgs boson would do. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'll uh, turn it back over to you, Megan, again. Um, thank you for all the great questions and we'll, we'll try and take care of the ones that uh, we weren't able to deal with live.